Ezell Ford, Riddell Jones, Brother Africa Charlie Kunang, Yvette Henderson, Kendrick McDade, Ayana Stanley Jones, Mike Brown, Megan Hockaday, Brendan Glenn, Tanisha Anderson. We say their names. We say their names. We say the names that are so many that we could continue to say names until my mouth became dry, until I lose my breath like Eric Garner until my time runs out, until the sun sets, we could say names. We could say names of the children who will never make it home to the arms of their mothers and their fathers, of mothers who will never rock their children to sleep again, of fathers and grandfathers whose stories will never make it to the memories of their children and grandchildren. We say their names. And we could keep saying names, we could bathe in the pain of it all, or we can spend our time talking about how to end this cycle, how to get free. But there's one more name that I'd like to lift up, Marshawn McCarroll. You may remember that Marshawn McCarroll was an Ohio-based Black Lives Matter activist who at 23 years old, on February 8th of this year, took his own life. The media spin began immediately. Media said that Marshawn's last words were, today my demons won, I'm sorry. Like everyone else, Marshawn had demons, he had pain. We all have that lurking in the shadow of our lives. But the media lied. Those weren't Marshawn's last words. Marshawn's last words were tweeted out from the steps of the Ohio State House. They were, let the record reflect that I pissed on the State House steps before I left. Marshawn's last words were the words of resistance. Marshawn's last words reflected that it wasn't the struggle that weighed him down. It wasn't the struggle that had taken an emotional toll. It wasn't his will to resist that ultimately took him out. It was the everyday oppression that he faced. It was living in a state like Ohio where a 12-year-old boy, Tamir Rice, is killed for playing in a park with a toy during a holiday break. That's what took Marshawn out. Marshawn's last words were words of resistance. They reflected one who would rather die on his feet than live on his knees. Marshawn's last words remind me of the African mothers who once captured from their homelands, rather than submit to slavery, jumped off the sides of ships, sometimes with their babies in their arms. They would not become chattel. They would not become someone else's property. Marshawn's last words were words of resistance, and they make me remember the words of Henry Highland Garnett, who in 1843 wrote in his Address to the Slaves of the United States, let our motto be resistance, resistance, resistance. No oppressed people have ever secured their liberty without resistance. So what is resistance? Resistance is a refusal to a, submit to a system that keeps us oppressed, imprisoned, and exploited. And resistance is something more. 
Resistance is the courage, the audacity to imagine and work towards building a world that is freer and more just. So what are we resisting? It's important that we understand the system that we live under. Manning Marable writes that the system that we currently live under is one that was intentionally and systematically built to privilege a few at the expense of the many. The system that we live under is a system of white supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative capitalism. The system that we live under builds educational structures that oppress our children, where black and indigenous dropout rates continue to climb even as everyone else's fall. An educational system where black boys are suspended at rates that signal that they are disposable and black girls in South Carolina are flung around classrooms like rag dolls by security. An educational system that continues to uplift the lie of white saviors like Christopher Columbus while editing out the stories and experiences and histories of people of color, of women, of LGBTQ folks, of poor folks, of working class folks. The system that we live under builds economic structures where black people are still unemployed at the exact same comparative rate as we were un unemployed at the time when records were first kept, double, double that of everyone else. An economic structure where the average white household wealth is almost 15 times the average black household wealth. The system builds a prison industrial complex where one in three black men are imprisoned and one in 18 black women. It fuels a policing system that surveils, monitors, assaults, brutalizes, harasses, and kills black people every 28 hours by law enforcement, vigilantes, and security guards. That is what we are fighting. We are resisting that kind of oppressive system. So why are we resisting? We're resisting in the names of all of those who I just called. We're resisting in their names and in the names of their parents. We're resisting in the names of Andrew Joseph and Deanna Hardy Joseph, whose son won't make it home. We're resisting in the name of Misha Charlton, who mourns her sister constantly. We're resisting in those names, and we're also resisting in the names of our ancestors, of Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Nat Turner, all of those who struggled to free ourselves despite the lie that's told to us in classrooms that Lincoln freed the slaves. We're resisting in the name of Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, and the black club women who said that black bodies will no longer hang from trees like strange fruit in the late 19th and early 20th century. We're resisting in the name of Joanne Robinson, of Ella Baker, of Coretta Scott King, of Martin Luther King, who struggled for civil rights and voting rights. And we're even resisting in the name of Kwame Ture, Didan Kamathi, and yes, Huey P. Newton, who had the audacity to call for black power and we're resisting for ourselves. We're resisting because our sanity and humanity depend on our resistance. We're resisting so that our children can walk and live in a world that's really free. So how are we resisting? Let me be really clear. Black people have been struggling for freedom since we were stolen from Africa. This isn't new, this is a continuum of struggle, a continuum of resistance. However, we're resisting differently now. 
we're resisting as our new normal. Now I'm gonna cite someone who I never cite, Mohammed El Aryan. He was the CEO of PIMCO, and in 2008, he wrote a piece around new normalcy. El Aryan was talking about market systems, and what he said is that markets run in cycles, but something different happened in 2008. See, it's assumed that market cycles will run and there'll be little blips on the screen. These are our recessions and our depressions. Ultimately, these recessions and depressions will exist but will return to that old cycle. In 2008, the recession, or what black people experienced as a depression, wasn't a blip on the screen. It was the ushering in of a new cycle. And he argued that this is our new normal. I'll argue that resistance is our new normal. For 40 years, we'd abided by a cycle, a cycle that was built by white supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative capitalism. That cycle was that this system exists and it acculturates us into a particular set of norms. We can accept these norms. We can assimilate. We can choose not to name our children African names like my children, Tandiwe Amara and Amen, or like Ayana Stanley Jones. We can choose to pull up our pants, as encouraged by Bill Cosby and others, to not listen to rap music, to smile at white folks, to nod, to not talk about race too much. We can assimilate, we can straighten our hair, we can speak in their English rather than our own. We can assimilate and if we do it well enough, we'll be rewarded. That's the old cycle. And there were occasional blips on the screen, like when Margaret Mitchell, the black woman, senior citizen, homeless person who was killed for carrying a screwdriver. Or like Devin Brown, the 13-year-old boy who was killed in a hail of bullets by LAPD for joyriding in his stepmother's car. Or like Oscar Grant, who was killed on a BART platform by Johannes Meserly on January 1st, 2009. Those were blips. There were moments of uprising, but ultimately we returned to the normal cycle. On July 13th, 2013, what we witnessed, what we experienced was a new normal, resistance as a new normal. The idea that no longer we would we submit to a system that keeps us oppressed, rather than, rather we would resist white supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative capitalism. We'd resist with all that we have, knowing that we would meet counter forces. But that counter force wouldn't beat us back into the old cycle. No, instead, it would strengthen our resolve and we would ultimately win. Resistance is our new normal. We see resistance everywhere. We see resistance as the new normal when black college students rise up at places like Providence College, UC Irvine, Mizzou, Cal State LA, and demand that black students' experiences be recognized. We see resistance as a new normal when people in Flint, Michigan say that we have the right to clean water. And we would see resistance as a new normal when organizers, when regular black folks come out into the streets and join hands with Sabrina Fulton and Tracy Martin, with Wanda Johnson and Uncle Bobby and say that no longer will we allow our people to be hunted and killed. No, black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. 
So you have a choice. Your choice is, will you cling to an old, dying cycle? Or will you walk with us, recognizing that resistance is the new normal? Resistance is the new normal. In the words of the phenomenal hip-hop artist and Ferguson organizer, Tef Poe, they keep asking, when we going back in the house? We ain't never going back in the house. Thank you.